Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Chairwoman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first I would like to thank very deeply uh, Professor Mohamed Rela and Dr. Tom Cherian for their kind invitation. Um, I will focus my talk today uh, to technical issue in retransplantation. Uh, I intended to make this talk very practical, so uh, just uh, to set the picture, retransplantation represents an average of 10% of liver transplant. And their its results uh, are not so good that primary transplant. You can see 60 to 80 percent survival at one year and around 50 percent at five years. Second, the, uh, uh, this result is mainly due to an increased early mortality, mainly due to sepsis. And retransplantation is associated with ethical and economical issues. So, these technical issues uh, are the followings. A difficult dissection of the primary graft first, especially for delayed retransplantation. The amount of hemorrhage and transfusion, as we said before uh, earlier today. The technique of graft implantation and the vessels reconstruction. So, a few points about the choice of the adequate liver graft for retransplantation. I think that uh, it's better not to use marginal donors. The problem is that uh, very nice liver graft today uh, are more and more uh, rare, but retransplantation is associated with so technical difficulty that it's better not to use marginal donors. What is the uh, donor's age limit? I don't know. There is uh, no uh, limit uh, in the literature, but maybe less than 50 years old would be ideal. I think it's better to avoid partial grafts, such as split grafts or live donors, because of the hemorrhage, the risk of hemorrhage from the cut surface, and most of all because of technical complications with um, short vessels and multiple vessels. And at last, it's always better to limit cold ischemia time in these circumstances. So, can we anticipate the difficulties uh, in the recipient of a retransplantation? First, you can imagine that in case of ischemic cholangitis or ischemic type cholangitis, there will be some inflammation and sometimes a very severe inflammation. Sometimes you have portal hypertension uh, and that increases the risk of hemorrhage and the difficulty of dissection. The technique of first liver graft implantation is also important to consider and I think that before beginning starting a retransplantation you must read again uh, the uh, uh, former operative procedure that uh, you, you wrote or somebody else wrote. You must study the vascular supply as always, but maybe more precisely in these circumstances and to have a precise vascular mapping, especially in patients with thrombosed vessels and thrombosed artery, for instance. First, uh, the early retransplantation is probably easier than delayed retransplant. It's uh, the main causes here, etiologies for early retransplantation, primary non-function, hepatic artery thrombosis and portal vein thrombosis, it represents 30% of retransplantation. More difficult probably are late retransplantations, more than three months after primary transplantation, due to ischemic cholangitis, due to hepatic artery thrombosis or ischemic-like cholangitis, 40% of retransplant, chronic rejection and recurrent disease, especially uh, hepatitis C uh, virus. So, if in this uh, late retransplant, we have to face technical issues. What are the problems of dissection? First, the anatomy is distorted with adhesions, and these adhesions are sometimes very uh, are vascularized with a risk of hemorrhage and need for transfusion, and those transfusions in turn increase the risk of sepsis and so on. So, if we summarize 
uh, retransplantation, it's a difficult operation for experienced surgeons. What are the solutions? These are uh, the ones I wanted to, to speak about today. A meticulous dissection first. It's obvious that uh, it's better to be meticulous in surgery, but especially in these uh, circumstances of difficult dissection in retransplantation. I recommend the use of bipolar coagulation instead of monopolar to avoid, avoid gut injury because uh, there is a risk of postoperative perforation of intestine, uh, artery rupture when there is a, a leak of um, digestive fluid. It's something like, you know, the transplantation of children with biliary atresia with these very uh, vascularized adhesions. It's sometimes the same uh, picture in retransplant in adults. We may uh, take advantage of the use of venovenous bypass. It's very important in case of uh, uh, difficult dissection with uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, adhesions. And we might use a different technique for total hepatectomy, such as the technique from left to right. I will tell you how it is. So just a, a short clip about the venovenous bypass. Here you can put a cannula in the inferior mesenteric vein or in the main, the trunk of the portal vein. Just an example to show you the dissection of the inferior mesenteric vein. I'm sorry for this uh, bad quality. And uh, you put a cannula, of course, in the femoral vein. And this, the percutaneous uh, introduction of the cannula is very important. It, that decreased uh, dramatically the uh, complications of the port in the tube insertions. You see here, this reinforced cannula, the leader. wash the, the cannula before connecting to the circuit. Then the cannula in the left, axillar vein, you can use al also the jugular vein, of course. The ultrasound, mandatory to put, especially in the axillary vein here. The leader, dilatation, and the cannula. in the axillary vein, and you connect all these tubes to the circuit and the pump with monitoring, of course, of the rotation and the blood flow. And this will be checked by the anesthesiologist, of course. Again, I totally agree with you, Nigel, about the importance of sharing information between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon. The pump started and you see the blood begin slowly and then you increase the rotation. Here we are. So, Another technique to make it easy, easier, it's the left to right approach described by Federica Dondero a few years ago. Uh, you can see here the dissection of the uh, left part of the liver, here um, temporary portocaval shunt, and this allows to control even the main hepatic veins without torsion of the inferior vena cava and so with less hemodynamic instability. About the graft implantation, the standard implantation with end-to-end -end caval anastomosis with or without venous bypass is the major technique representing almost 80% of retransplantation. But you can use an iterative piggyback implantation without venous bypass using uh, sometimes the portacaval shunt and um, of course, IVC and portal vein must be divided very close to uh, the primary liver graft to leave the previous anastomosis intact, just in case to have enough length of vessels. 
I will show you just another short clip to show you. You see here this uh, ugly liver graft with ischemic chondritis, abscess, and of course, very tight adhesions of the in intestinal mass to the liver and the use of the bipolar coagulation for dissection of the whole liver and the hepatic pedicle. Here is the uh, an iliac conduit which was thrombosed, it's dissected pre here, you will see that's the cause of all the trouble in this patient. You see here, thrombosis, the section of the bile duct here, which is uh, closed in, in this distal part because it was not possible to reuse it, unfortunately. Then the dissection of the portal vein. You can see there is a, some sheath thick here. You must be very careful not to open the portal vein. It's fragile. It looks like fibrotic, but it's fragile. Here there is a clamp on the IVC, which is open to perform a temporary portocaval shunt again, which be, will be very useful to dissect for the end of the dissection of the liver first, and uh, to have a good um, portal drainage and no venous congestion. Here, there is a clamp on the vena cava. It's blood in the, the liver, which is removed. that's it. You see this necro necrotic liver with this is area of necrosis. Here this is the dissection. This patient had an accurate ligament and of course we wanted to use again a branch of the celiac axis so this accurate ligament is cut. Very important. We have time to prepare the splenic artery because there is a porta caval shunt. The splenic artery is clamped, ligated here, closed distally, and this splenic artery is flipped to the right and will be used to re reperfuse the artery of the second liver graft. We measure everything for the anastomosis. I think it's always better. And here, this, this nice liver, the distal end of the IVC has been closed. And another piggyback anastomosis is performed. But you will see it was a bit difficult here because the clamp was not good. and. The tissue was very short on the uh, recipient IVC. So we decided to put a venous patch here from an allogenic vein taken from the donor. And just to enlarge the anastomosis and not to have a, a narrow anastomosis here. Anyway. So in this difficult retransplantation, you have to be ready for those technical tips. Then the other side. Here, portal vein is cut and anastomosed to the graft portal vein with the growth factor. You can see here reperfusion of the liver graft and then anastomosis of the splenic artery to the graft hepatic artery.
and the lever looks nice. Flushing and the artery is unclamped. You see? Okay. Now, in patients with thrombose hepatic artery, various techniques may be used, such as the, the proximal common hepatic artery, the splenica artery, uh, like uh, we just saw. And you can see here this patient uh, from the movie had an arcuate ligament that must be, of course, um, cut if you want to use, again, a branch of the celiac axis. More important, on aortic implantation is very, very useful in retransplantation in a patient with an already thrombosed hepatic artery. And uh, you, we use most of the time the infernal aorta with an iliac conduit from the donor or from a tissue bank. You can also use the supraceliac aorta uh, with uh, performing uh, first this anastomosis before um, the portal vein and the uh, IVC, especially in children. It's easier in children, I, I think. Just the same thing, the splenic artery, the aortoiliac conduit, just uh, uh, a few seconds here to show you. You see here the conduit on the foreignal aorta, which is here, passing behind the colon. And here, the anastomosis here to the celiac trunk of the liver graft, with your fusion, the hepatic artery. What about portal vein reconstruction? Sometimes it's necessary when uh, there is a thrombosed portal vein. You need to go very far just behind uh, the duodenum. Here you can see there is the splenic vein and super mesenteric vein. And we, it's necessary to perform the anastomosis very uh, proximally uh, with the retractors here. But this needs to be well known. This is another view. Uh, when there is a cannula, you see in the thick portal vein and after remove the, removing the cannula, the anastomosis here. At last, biliary reconstruction. Um, we used an iterative duct-to-duct. -duct. It's probably the best, but we cannot use only in, uh, can use only in 40% of patients. It's necessary not to use the primary graft bile duct, of course. And in 60%, you use renal hepaticojejunostomy. Uh, we use sometimes in um, iterative duct-to-duct, -duct, we put an internal stent here, it's a rubber stent, uh, which uh, will uh, be removed later on by ERCP. So, to conclude this talk, I would say that retransplantation is more difficult than primary transplant with technical issue for late retransplantation. Full size liver graft from deceased non marginal donors are the best suited for this kind of transplantation. Standard implantation with selective use of venovenous bypass uh, are most, most often used, but piggyback is possible, as you saw in, in the movie, and adequate arterial reconstruction is needed often on infrarenal aorta. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you for that excellent and beautifully illustrated talk. Can I invite some questions um, while we're waiting for someone to come up? Would you like to come up to the platform? Uh, the, the thing I would like to emphasize is uh, I think it's important to keep the vessels as long as you can in the hilum to stick close to the liver in your dissection. It allows you um, plenty of room for error. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm Transplant Surgery Fellow in Shiraz Organ Transplant Center in uh, Repu Islamic Republic of Iran. I'm asking about the, the early retransplantation. Um, actually, what parameters you depends on for uh, how early is early is best for retransplantation? So sometimes you have like uh, a dilemma between a delayed graft function and non-functioning graft. So is it the patient? general condition patient is awake, fully awake, or is it urine output, or is it lab data? Because whenever you catch as early as possible for retransplant, it is better. Second thing, if the patient starts to fail, some organs to fail, for example, to have a renal failure, and you need to start the patient on uh, replacement therapy, especially CRRT, 
do you have any experience of intraoperative CRRT during retransplantation? Thank you. Intraoperative? Uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. So, uh, hemodial filtration during surgery. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes we use hemodial filtration, yes, but not in these circumstances, not mostly, but especially in acute liver failure uh, with patients with, um, you know, either uh, acute on chronic liver disease or acute liver or hepatofibrillant hepatitis, but not in this uh, kind of patient. But I, I think if, if you have a patient coming very early to retransplantation with a primary numb function with severe fluid sequestration, coagulopathy, they're fluid overloaded, they're, they're the blow phases, Michelin yeah. man, yeah. Um, would you use hemodial filtration yeah, pre sure, and sure, yeah. peroperatively? Of course. No, I was thinking about the, the delayed retransplantation. Uh, okay, um, in the early retransplant, uh, what parameters you depend on for early catching the patient for retransplant? I mean that uh, usually in your series for the early, I'm not speaking about the late patient for rejection, no, for non-functioning graft. What is the lab data you will output that you will decide this patient is going for retransplant as okay. early as possible? The indications for early retransplantation in graft dysfunction, non-function. What would be your criteria you'd look for? Uh, <laughs> for primary non-function, I think that's probably easy. The liver graft is not working at all. There is no coagulation, the coma, hypoglycemia, anuria, and so on. So that's it. For dysfunction, it's much more difficult. Uh, I, the criteria are, are, are very difficult. Uh, I, I think. So I would say if the lactate has not gone back to less than two, 36 hours after transplant, you have a patient at risk and they need close monitoring. And if they're deteriorating, transplant them, and if they're improving, wait. If there are no other questions, then I'd like to thank all of the speakers for those excellent talks and to close the session. Thank you.